This is the 18th season of Bass Talk Live. With your host, Matt Pankrat. BTL is brought to you by Lorenz, Bass Cat Boats, AFCO, Ducket Fishing, Strike King Lures, Sunline, Big Bite Baits, Spro, X Zone Lures, Gamakatsu, The Bass Tank, Denali Rods and Pro Guy Facts. PTL coming at you. Good Tuesday, everybody. It is February 8, 2022, and this is Bass Talk Live, where we are going to talk about bass fishing. Have an awesome show today. A big friend of the show, uh, and I've actually gotten to know him. A lot better recently. I'd say over the last couple years since he's been a regular on BTL. Filled in for me while I was on the Opens last year. And then actually sent an invitation to stay at his house during the Open this past week that I fished. And I was a little nervous because uh, he self-admittedly will say he's a little bit OCD. And that would be Charlie Hartley who is going to join us. And man, we had some good conversations over the week before he went to bed at 7.30 every single evening. But we had some really good conversations over the week and uh, uh, old school conversations, new school kind of thought processes, what's going on, some great stories from the past. And I said, man, I said, I got to get you on the show when we come back and instead of just kind of do a regular interview, kind of dive into a little bit of history, a little bit of backstory. And he said, you're not just having me on because you're, I'm letting you stay at my house, are you? And I said, no, dude. I said, you're like a fan favorite. Everybody loves Charlie Hartley coming on. So we're going to talk to Charlie Hartley in the second half of the show. He's actually currently in his uh, immaculate garage in Florida, digging through some old school baits. He, he, you know, Charlie's caught a bass or a fish. I shouldn't say bass. Sometimes it's bluegill. Sometimes it's a crappie. But for over 800 consecutive days, it's kind of one of the things that keeps him going. And uh, sometimes he'll send me, he'll say the streak is alive. And I'll say, what is that hanging out of his mouth? And he'll say, Oh, you're too young to know about this bait. So maybe he'll show us some of those, a couple, uh, news and notes before we bring Charlie, you know what? I'm going to bring Charlie in on the second half of this news and notes. Cause I want to get his opinion on this too. But first of all, if you remember last month and I have to pull up my phone cause he sent me the link on my phone for it. Uh, we had Brandon Burks on and Brandon Burks was a young angler who, uh, had caught the, potential world record mean mouth out of OHIV eight, I think like eight thirty seven, something like that. And he came on and talked about how he was going through the whole process. Dude catches a lot of big fish down there. So he's not like new to him. Like, Oh my gosh, how do I do this record process? And he went through and after the show, he said, Hey man, I just want to give you a heads up. He said, there might be some issues. And he caught it on an umbrella rig. And, uh, I said, well, just keep me informed and I'll let let everyone know what's going on. And he sent me a article from uh, the Daily Sentinel, which published, which was the Saturday and Sunday edition for February 6th. And unfortunately, the title is a world record that isn't angler and IGFA speak on Alabama rig ruling. And uh, basically, although Brandon did everything right, they took uh, samples of the fish tissue. It was a mean mouth it was the biggest mean mouth that has ever been caught but he had multiple hooks on it and therefore did not qualify as the igfa world record so that kind of stinks but hopefully he gets some good publicity i don't really know uh i don't really know him that well he seems like a super nice kid Uh, i know he's getting into the guiding business i know he said since all this has gone down he's been absolutely slammed and he's still catching eight to 12 pounders on a pretty regular basis down there in Texas. So just a little recap on the world record that isn't. I don't know how I would take that. You caught the biggest fish ever. You're using a a lure lure that was 100% legal. You're doing nothing wrong. Everything was right, and it doesn't count because they don't recognize that lure. In other news, uh, the Bass Master Classic is 
going back to Knoxville in 2023, I forgot to mention this with Holman on the show yesterday. Really good show with Brad Holman, kind of breaking down some stuff from the open. And uh, we'll continue to tweak and get better uh, with that show, with the highlight show. But everyone seemed to think that that was a kind of a really good concept of just kind of taking clips, breaking down each of the nine opens uh, and getting Holman back in here on a on a regular basis, potentially working on that kind of a uh, little bit more into the future. But the 2023 Classic, uh, it was announced that it is headed back to Knoxville. And if you remember, Knoxville was the venue for the last Classic before the BPT Elite Series split. It was kind of, I believe it was the 49th Classic. We actually did a uh, documentary that is available on the BTL YouTube channel called the 49th Classic, where we kind of talked about uh, everything that was going on down there. But the uh, date events for that will be March 24th through 26th, 2023. And I'm sure every uh, small bait flat side balsa manufacturer there in the East Tennessee area is excited for all the anglers to go spend thousands of dollars on balsa baits. Uh, I'm going to bring Charlie in for this next one before we get into it, because I want to get his opinion on this. What's up, Charlie? Hi, Matt. Long time no see. Uh, does that mean Knoxville's the classic we're going to qualify for this year? Well, I, I mean, I'm on the dink and dunk pattern, Charlie. I'm looking for top 40s. There's a pretty good chance you might be there, though, if you look at your open history. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. I know it's only a charity invite because of the nice hospitality I offered you, but I'll take it. That that's it. If, it. if it hadn't been for the ample supply of cold Coors Lights, I would not. You would not have gotten an invite, Charlie. It was fun. I enjoyed having your youth in the house. Oh, I wouldn't go that far, youth. We did stay up that first night. We stayed up past eleven uh, with you and Tracy. We told stories and talked. And the, the next morning, you woke up. We said we can't do that again. <laughs> You're a bad influence. Get out of my house. <laughs> I, I will say the best part, the most part, the part that I enjoyed every evening, which I did not realize was a ritual in the Hartley household, was Jeopardy. Yep. And again, get out of the house. You're too good at Jeopardy. So normally I dominate in our family battle, Tracy and I, and uh, you made me feel small. <laughs> well, here's the thing. There happened to be... There happen to be several categories of uh, like English or grammar word association. My mom was an English teacher for 35 years. I grew up having to write. Then I wrote for the Bass Zone. I do the show. I talk. So I kind of and I just it just so happened that there were some very uh, lucky categories. But there are some other ones where we all just looked at each other and went, huh? You're being humble. You uh, you are very intelligent. I thought only your smarts were in the uh uh, social media and the bash talk live, but you are a smart young man. And, and we have not watched Jeopardy since I got hit in the head with the tungsten. So it's probably all out the window now. I'm prob probably will never get another question. Right. I'm glad you're okay. Cause uh, that video was dramatic. It could have been really worse. <laughs> have you ever done that? Um, I, I broke a windshield. I cracked my lip open once, uh, not nearly as uh, violent. Uh, it was literally just pendulum, penduluming back at me from a flip, and I didn't get out of the way thinking it wasn't going to do anything, but that tungsten has no give, and if my lip would not have been in front of my front tooth, it would have knocked it cleaned out. I broke a windshield, and I've broken uh, – the cover on one of my instruments on my dash before tungsten is really dangerous. The one that broke my windshield was only three sixteenths ounce. So, I mean, it's just like a bullet or worse because uh, it doesn't flatten out like lead. It, uh, it penetrates. Yeah. That's a pretty common thing for the guys. Oh, I'm getting a little bit of feedback there. That's a pretty common thing for the guys who punch a lot. I mean, that happens every year. Like there's a couple close calls. You get zonked, you get hit. The big thing there is the glasses, right? You want to have, shatterproof plastic lenses i yep. believe yep that would be a great idea i wish i took that precaution all right i wanted to get you in for this because yesterday i i kind of had a i didn't have a meltdown but i kind of got a little bit fired up because i had i was unaware that the uh pro circuit this year went to zeroing the weights uh going into uh the final round and uh i was opposed opposed to it i mean even though 
it like I said, I have nothing against the organization that they're doing it. I'm sure it's fine, but it's been done throughout history in all organizations, and it never seems to really stick. Brad was under the impression it's 100% for media so that when you go on that final day, there's not a runaway win. I pointed out that uh, it, it's it's like a marathon, not a sprint, that it should be encompass the entire tournament. And then I got an email uh, from a listener uh, named Eric who disagreed he liked the zero cuts he thought that it was actually a pure form of fishing he went so far as to say i would love the elite series to go 90 on day one cut to 50 on day two then 20 on day three and 10 on day four with the weight zeroed after each day of competition he said it's a more pure form of competition that rewards consistency he said making the cut after each day of competition then resetting the weights each day would be a more useful way of seeing who is really best on that body of water over over a given period of time without giving too much weight to one outstanding performance, such as we saw with Joey Sifuentes in this Open, who went almost 29 pounds and then 10 and then 9 pounds, still finished second, though. He's kind of playing devil's advocate here. He had a, a hockey reference that was talking about, hey, let's say the Canadians uh, and outscore them 22 to 2, and then they start over anyway. That was his take on it. You've been doing this game a lot a lot charlie you've probably competed in some of the tournaments that do zero the weights after the cuts what are your thoughts on zeroing the weights during an event um definitely creates more fan interest no doubt about it um but as a tournament angler to be leading the tournament and then be tied for 10th place would be uh frustrating and it is frustrating uh, if you're in 10th place it's the greatest thing that could happen to you um the normally the best angler still wins, but uh, it certainly opens it up for a guy to have a, uh, a, you know, catch a 10 pounder that is in 10th place and have the biggest bag that day. Um, you know, just by catching a 10 pounder the last day and not for four days in a row, bringing in consistently bigger bags and winning. I don't like them zeroing out. Another thing they changed this year, Matt, I don't know if you noticed at the first, uh, Toyota and Okeechobee, they changed the final day to 25 instead of 10, which uh, my buddy made the top 10. And uh, I said, well, at least you're going to stay in the top 10. He said, maybe not. They cut it to 25 now. And, and I said, oh, it, it won't change the outcome for you guys at the top 10. But a guy in the 11th place weighed a big bag and won the tournament. So everyone in the top 10 got knocked back a spot that they wouldn't have if they'd have been cut to 10. So it has more implications than we believe and zeroing it out is there's no doubt about it. It's only for the writers and the fans. It has no mathematical reasoning as far as a four day tournament. It'd be different if it was a one day tournament and then you go to another lake or something like that. There'd be like they do on the when you change venues, it certainly makes sense. And when he compared it to hockey, that's each game they start over. That'd be like each one of our tournaments they start over after four days, not after one day. So I think it's a bad analogy. Um, but especially with TV and with live and everything we've got going on now, there's even more reason for the media to vote for zeroing it out. I totally get it. Uh, if they were gonna, if they were gonna have all the same fans on day one as day four, uh, maybe. But uh, it's really just slanting the viewership to the last day. I hear you. Uh, I want to make a quick uh, announcement. I see some of the stuff on the instant feedback. The This is uh, the last day to register for Bass Master Fantasy Fishing. You don't play fantasy. Do you play fantasy fishing, Charlie? Uh, only not not uh, only in my head. Whenever I, I listen to the tournament, I'm like, I would have had him on my team. Sometime <laughs> I need to do that because we certainly have uh, a little uh, – experience with that we could certainly make some good decisions with that. you can you should do that today you should get on it's real easy you just go here i'll walk you through it i'd rather go fishing i'd rather go here's the thing you can go fishing and play fantasy fish it takes like five to, minutes i don't have to fantasy fish i can real fish <laughs> you could do both uh but if you want to join it the i did create a a uh, group a couple days ago bass talk live is just the group okay. it's on uh it's on the Bassmaster Fantasy Fishing site, and as it is with MLF, and I need to find the the BPT code uh, again because it's like a code that you have to put in to join that one. I need to find what that is, and I'll give you guys that again tomorrow. But if you join the Bass Talk Live group, the winner will get one of these 7-4 uh, Denali Lithium Pros. That's the spinning rod that I 
catch a lot and, of fish. Uh, and the Hartley Hogs Fishing Club would love that. So I might enter just to win one of your rods and give it to the club. Oh, What's your opinion on cutting it to 25 in the Toyotas? Were you aware of that? Uh, I saw that they did that. I was, you know, we were fishing the open and I didn't know if it was something like a weather related or maybe they had to cut or do something. But the 25, I'll tell you, Bass has done that in the open. So like in 2020, they went from the top 10 to the top 12 on the final day. So like at Neely Henry, I was in eighth and I was pumped because if you look at my stats, it's like zero top tens. And I'm like, that's a not, that's not a good look. Like I have a, you know, a, a ton of like just outside to get top twenties and all that. So I make the cut and I was like super pumped. I was like, thank God, finally top 10 in the open. And then I realized 12 are fishing. And then I come in with two spotted bass on the final day and I finish 11th. So I still have no top tens of the opens. But I'll tell you uh, how backwards my priorities are. I, I wasn't even aware that Bass Masters noted how many top fives, top tens. And when I made a top 10 at Potomac, uh, finished in the top five with uh, uh, Skeet Reese won it at one of the elites or tour events. I'm standing in the 10 afterwards with Randy Howe, and he's like, oh, sign an autograph. He's like, get in here, Hartley. We're going to sign autographs and everything. He goes, man, you get to add another top five to your standings on Bassman. <laughs> and I looked at him like, what? <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> you don't ever look at that? <laughs> I do now that he told me about it, but I was so naive. I didn't know. And uh, just a, a, a funny fact. Uh, several years ago in the magazine, they listed the top 100 money winners all time and the top 100 uh, most tournaments fished all time. And I was proud at that time to be like in the top 40 in most Bassmaster tournaments fished. I did barely make the top 100 in the most money one, but I thought the proportions were funny that I am in the top 40 for participating the most, but not the top 40 for winning. <laughs> Yeah, see, 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 uh, 43 top 30 finishes, 27 top 20 finishes, 10 top 10 finishes, a third, two seconds, and a first. It's a hell of a resume, Charlie. Doesn't sound too bad if I was 20. <laughs> All right, so that's that on the uh, fantasy fishing. Uh, well, while we're on that, let's jump into it then, because one, one of the things that uh, we talked about while you were getting your tackle ready for what a 16th place finish in the open was uh kind of the difference between the opens and the elite series as far as having success in them the competition level the dedication the type of anglers how you have to approach that event and you've had a lot like you've had a lot of success in the opens and on the elite series but way more consistent on the opens which has a field that is two and a half times as big as the elite series when you fished it. Um, yeah, the, uh, it really boils down to, you just have to catch fish. It does not matter who you're fishing against as easy as that is to say. And as much as we're taught that, um, there's no way you can't notice who you're fishing against and there's no way it can't uh, affect the way you perform. But if you bring in a bunch of fish, it doesn't, or a big bag of fish, it doesn't matter if there's 225 guys in the tournament or 50 guys in the tournament, you're going to do well. Um, so if, if at all possible, try to compete against the fish. The, uh, when I fished the elites, I always fished at least one open division and I double qualified several times because of the open division. Um, and uh, I think at that time, I was not putting as much pressure on myself at the Opens. The Opens to me were, oh, good, I'm not at an elite. It's not costing me $20,000. I'm not scared to finish in 100th against the best in the world. I'm here at an Open to enjoy it and, and do well. But uh, it was just a different stress factor to me after I had already qualified up, qualified up to the tour. Um, although when I was fishing the opens and the invitationals to make the tour, it was a huge stress factor. Uh, like you, like now we had three or four tournaments. And if you messed up one single day, you weren't going to go to the classic and you weren't going to go to the tour. So, um, it was a lot easier to fish those opens when I was already fishing the elites, a whole different, uh, stress level. How do you think your decision-making changes under pressure? Um, for me, I, uh, uh, how can I put this PG? I don't have uh, enough guts uh, when there's a lot of pressure on me. I, I stay in my box. 
I'm scared to swing, you know, the term swing for the, I'm, I'm scared to go with what my, what my gut's telling me a lot of times because I'm stuck in a little box where I need to get five in the box. Um, so str- uh, pressure changes my fishing a bunch. Um, when you're out there fun fishing, you can look across the lake and say, hey, that looks good over there. I'm going to go over there and try it. You know, when you're in eight hours and you got four hours left and you got three in the box and you look over there and say, Hey, I ought to go try that. You're like, I better stay right here and finish my limit. <laughs> I, I was kind of surprised at how much pressure you put on yourself in this open. And you maybe didn't even realize it though, but I was like, man, Charlie's stressed out and he's catching them and has caught them and has a great game plan. You know, it, it's on your home home lake for the winter where you where you live there in in st cloud you spend a lot of time on that chain of lakes but uh you know even with a game plan and and getting bit and having a a solid uh track record you were it seemed like you were still feeling it going into that tournament but then i realized that might just be every tournament for you it is um i guess what i enjoy about tournaments is i'm a stress junkie and uh (laughs) I have a huge ego and uh, they're going to put on the internet how I finished. And uh, my fishing skills mean the world to me. And when I don't do well, I'm uh, very disappointed in myself. So I put a huge amount of stress on myself. I I joke all the time back before I led that classic, nobody looked on the weigh-in sheet to see where Charlie Hartley finished. You know, if I did well, they went, wow, Charlie did good. Great. But no one was, uh, uh, surprised when I wasn't in the money and after you do well and make a little name for yourself then people start looking at the list like oh Charlie didn't do that good oh Charlie's not that good oh Charlie didn't do that good again so you start putting more pressure on yourself to do better because you think more people are watching it's as simple as that sounds I think there's a lot of guys who struggle with that, even on a club level, just going out with 20 (laughs) boats and that. What are some of the ways that you've learned to to kind of cope and deal with it and then succeed and push through it? It's something that I've had to work with and and have created systems to where I don't put my, I try to minimize these stressful situations that I put myself in with decision making, with, with preparation, with getting ready. But what are some of the ways that as a nervous individual and an adrenaline junkie, you've still been able to channel that into success on a local regional and national level yep one of the things that uh helps me or one of the things that reasons i love fishing is there's so many details and my ocd can be fully uh encompassed in fishing between you know having your line right behind having your hook sharp having the right amount of baits in the box being prepared the more prepared you are even for public speaking which used to fear i used to fear the more prepared you are, the better you'll do. Um, uh, so that when that stress is kicking in, you don't have to, you know, uh, look for a lure or wonder if you have that in the boat. The more controllables you can control, uh, the better you are under stress. The other thing, just with time and experience, eventually you start to get more confident in yourself just based on the fact I've done this more than the guy next to me. I've been in this situation more than the guy next to me. I should have more to draw on and more history to get myself out of this jam. But, you know, that second day in the open, I had four hours to better that bag and I never upgraded. And that just kills me when that happens. I mean, here I am on a lake. I know like the back of my hand, I got four hours to upgrade and, uh, uh, didn't do it which uh when you told me how you got some of your bites the second day if i'd have had the 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 gumption to go run some of my old stuff go in behind and throw my torpedo but whenever i do that i feel like i'm goofing off i'm not working i'm playing now but there are times i need to go play and let my instincts take over absolutely that's interesting how you use your uh organizational skills as a way to cope with the with the stress and stuff so everything yeah. in the boat that's what i thing do the same thing is, yeah, it doesn't do spin you out so it, yeah that's cool same thing with sign when uh when i've got it when it's overwhelming when i've got too much going on at sign i get up earlier i make lists even if i don't knock it all off the list at least i've got it on list and i'm looking at it and i knock one thing off at a time um and that's why i go to bed at 7 30. i wake up uh you know, at 3.30 or 4 o'clock without an alarm clock every day, uh, ready to 
uh, try to get ahead. You know, the early bird gets the worm. I'm trying to get ahead of all the other birds. You think there's a correlation between su- success on the water and success in business? Some of the same strategies that that work uh, in the business world and some of the same habits are translatable to success on the water? Some, but uh, the, the, the frustrating thing about fishing is you can do all the work you're supposed to do and still not get results. And one thing I have found in business, if you do all the things you're supposed to do, you will get the results. Uh, um, And that might be the fact that uh, some of your competition isn't doing that. And when you get to the tournament level, most of your competition is doing what you're doing. Uh, So then it comes down more to natural talent, good decision making. I mean, most of the guys in that tournament that were serious last week had all new line on, had all lures on, did all their homework, had their boat ready to go. Uh, but I think in the business world, it separates you more because a lot of your competition is not willing to work all those details. Fair enough. All right. We're talking with Charlie Hartley. We're going to take a break and then go into the second half of the show and get back. I think Charlie has picked up a couple old school baits behind that are still putting some fish in the boat. Some stuff that I haven't seen, some stuff that I haven't seen in a long time. We're going to get into that when we come back with BTL on a Tuesday. The Ultimate Fishing System by Lowrance. Your choice of powerful fish finding tools all connected. From sonar and trolling motor to navigation and networking to fit the way you fish. All with touch screen control from HDS Live. The heart of your system. Find more, see more, catch more with the Ultimate Fishing System by Lowrance. Upgrade to the Ultimate Fishing System and get up to $1,000 cash back. The new Puma STS has been redesigned from the ground up. With the angler, design, function, and performance in mind, nothing on this new offering was compromised, and the only thing carried over from the previous version is the name. Based on the soft touch series hull that started with the flagship Jaguar, this new model is nimble and performs incredibly well at all speeds with either a 250 or 300 horsepower engine. Featuring a new 96 inch wide body footprint, this hull measures out at 20 foot 7 inches in length. Industry leading design coupled with tournament winning performance. The Puma STS from Bass Cat. Feel the rush. I've been my living on the water for over 20 years. For 14 years. For over 23 years. I've worn a bunch of different clothing brands over the years. Some companies big. And some companies small. All of them said they were making clothing for us. But none of them knew us. None of them were us. Except for one. Except for one. Except one. AFCO. 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 Fishing isn't part of us. It is us. The KVD 100 Jerkbait. 15 different colors. A perfect combination of roll, wiggle, and flash. Increased castability. 3D eyes. Premium black nickel hooks. KVD. Tie one on. Striking lures. Elite Series Pro Daryl Gleason here. My Pro Guide batteries keep me going on those long tournament days and long practice days. Always plenty of juice, never fail. The best part about Pro Guide batteries, it's the people behind the company. They have over 40 years experience in the battery business, keeping all of us fishermen out on the water longer, catching more fish. Check them out at ProGuideBatteries.com. What's up, Bass Talk Live fans? Brandon Polinick here. And ever since I won a couple Bassmaster Elite Series events on X-Zone Lures, I've been getting a bunch of questions of what makes them so special and different. And really, the truth is, it's in the details. The little details, things like no cheap fillers in their plastic, that gives you more lifelike action, more realistic and vibrant colors. But don't just take my word for it. Go to www.xzonelures.com and check them out for yourself. Welcome back to BTL on a Tuesday, talking with Charlie Hartley, who has been furiously digging through his well-organized tackle box to pull out some old-school stuff that still catches him. And I'm always intrigued by this because everyone has their confidence lures, and yeah, there's new lures that come out, they're standbys, but it seems like there's a whole 
category, and maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm not old enough to know it, but it seems like there's a whole category of lures that like never stopped working that still work, but that just no one throws anymore. Would you agree? I agree. And uh, some of them, uh, some of them are, are confidence baits to me. Some of them I have weighed uh, when the certain s- circumstances develop. I know what bait I need to have on it. I've had some, I've weighed some giant bags and some giant fish on some of these baits. And even though they come out with new and improved ones or knockoffs, um, it's hard to, you know, there's certain baits you can't make better than the original. Are you a believer that this whole uh, fishing thing is like cyclical to where you have like generations of bass that get used to a certain lure, a certain vibration, it comes out, it's super hot, it works amazing, and then all of a sudden they get conditioned to it, people stop throwing it as much, generations of bass come, and then there's a whole new generation that that, that hasn't seen it, that hasn't felt it, and boom, it's just, it comes back into favor. Almost, I feel like the spinnerbait almost did that in a way when it got, the chatterbait got so popular that a lot of people stopped throwing the blades, and now it seems like uh, there's a, a lot of spinner baits that are coming back into play, even though the chatter bait has remained popular. I don't think the spinner bait ever quit catching fish. People quit throwing it. Um, and uh, the, the spinner bait and the chatter bait, two different categories, will be in our tackle boxes for the next thousand years. There's certain styles of lures that put off a certain vibration to fish that are always going to catch bass. I mean, it for a thousand years from now, but I do believe they get conditioned to some baits. Uh, a great example would be in Florida when the skinny dipper came out. Uh, when the skinny dipper first came out, you couldn't throw it without bass climbing over the Kissimmee grass to get it, uh, but it became so popular in this region that they did see it a lot, too much to the point where that vibration or that noise was not as big a trigger. Uh, another great example is a buzz bait. You know, uh, we've got whopper ploppers, we've got all these different things, but you're gonna see buzz baits tied to guys' lines, you know, for the next 500 years. They, uh, there's certain baits that are really hard to improve on um, that bass will always eat. They certainly do get conditioned to them, but a spinner bait has always caught fish. Uh, we just quit throwing it as much when the chatterbait came out. And uh, there were still every every guy, every pro still had a spinnerbait tied up in his boat, I'm sure. All right, what do you got? <laughs> okay, we're going to start with a category of baits that no one talks about anymore. And when I grew up, it was like a whole category you had to have. And we called them backup baits. They were crank baits that were supposed to imitate crayfish and swim backwards compared to a square bill. And one of the originals, of course, that I still throw to this day is the Fred Arbor Gas Mud Bug. Super hard lure to beat. When they came out with the 3D series, and I'm sorry, I'm learning to keep the no, spray. No, <laughs> yep, that looked like a crave. It's like back in your trailer. And that bait is incredibly good. Uh, shallow water uh, bank crankbait. Um, we called them backup crankbaits. The other the time and they still make is the cad poly uh same sorry <laughs> that's so tricky it's all good yep same uh theory as the mud bug basically meant to run backwards with its nose down like a crayfish uh on riprap along undercut banks um i can't tell you back in the day and another one that i don't have with me but i have a box full at home is called the bass magnet the billy west borland back magnet which looked like the rebel deep we are crayfish really looked like a crayfish uh with a bill on it and they you know they're they're meant to look like a crayfish running backwards um and you don't see anyone throw those anymore and i'm telling you they are fish catchers at uh tad poly at some of our lakes at home are uh Buckeye Canal lakes, the, the lakes that fed the first, uh, uh, our feeder lakes to the Buckeye Canal. Um, fantastic crankbait, incredible crankbait. Another bait that uh, no one throws anymore is an inline spinner. I don't have one handy, but uh, mm-hmm. early in the year, the Snagless Sally or even the good old Meps, believe it or not, or uh, the rooster tail uh, in the pad stems in 45 to 55 degree water is killer. 
killer cold water bait. Every every spring I throw one. What was the one that you sent me? It was some spoon looking one. Coming up. Charlie's going back to the the tool shop bench. All right, back in the day, um, there was a, a Strike King timber spoon. There was the PT spoon. Here we go again. There you go. It's this a, one's actually it's a weighted. Spoon. Those days. It looks like a. Uh, it looks. How, how would you describe this, Charlie, to the iTunes listeners? It is a skirted spoon. It's a skirted spoon similar to a silver minnow with a weed guard, but it's got lead weight in the tail that holds the weight in or holds the hook in, and it causes it to, when you stop reeling it, it'll walk backwards. Like when you reel it up to it out, off, out from under a dock, you can stop it, and it'll back up under the dock. The other one that was always popular in Ohio and still is, is the snaky spoon. Um, I stamp a metal spoon again, hooks are screwed in, weed guards riveted in, and I'm sorry I am there you go. with yeah. that. Yeah, it's, um, just the, it's like back in a trailer for the first time, Charlie. It's the opposite yep. of which direction you think I it's know. supposed and, to And I'll, I'll mess it up the whole show, so we'll only do this for a little while. But I've got, I catch so many fish on that. Years ago at Santee Cooper, one of the first times we went to Santee on Bass Tour, I weighed an 812 and an 88 and a an, uh, six pounder all in the same bag on that the first morning of the tournament. And the b- bites on this are ferocious. One of my favorite things about some of these lures is the bite. Um, the, uh, He's going back for more. The spoon. And then, of course, who forgets the uh, weed walker, the Norman weed walker, which is again that? is probably the most weedless buzz bait known to man. I've never seen one. Oh, you're kidding me. I think no. you can still buy these, man. And you have to see this come across duckweed, across pads, across hydrilla. Um, your buzz bait's actually in the center of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, describe that. It's like a, is that plastic on the it's top part of it? It's a plastic spoon so with, a, with like a, a chamber cut out picture like a spinnerbait head yep. that's riveted to a plastic spoon with like a, uh, what do they call those, a water wheel in the middle of the exactly. spoon? Exactly, yep. And it, and it runs like a, a subtle buzz bait. It sprays water in the air. Um, you can fish it really slow. It does not float. Um, and it, it's got a really good hookup ratio because of that weighted jig in the back. Killer bait. I, I so mean, why do you think people stopped throwing? This is a whole category of baits. And I remember, I mean, guys used to throw these things a lot, like in yep. tournament competitions, yep. like the top guys yep. in the world, the top yep. recreate. I mean, everyone used to throw these. And since I have gotten into bass fishing, which would have been the early 90s when I was just a little kid, like I've never thrown one. I've never even owned hey, you any You know, of the main these reason is students. technology, Matt. A lot of these lures are obsolete because of technology, because they figured out how to make good floating frogs and rats and uh, things that kind of... Uh, Technology with plastics and with materials now definitely have, have changed this. Uh, those baits have been replaced with frogs and popping frogs. And Okay, so uh, that's what you would throw on top of the muck and scum and then walk it through the openings and then drag it on top, and it was yep. just a pain in the butt compared to a, a hollow-bodied frog. But I'll tell you, the hookup ratio on a spoon is a lot better than a frog, believe it or not, just because of the weight of it. Uh, one of the biggest problems with a frog is, is when they open their mouth, the frog doesn't fall into their mouth. You know, it's floating or they blow it away a lot of times. A spoon is heavy enough that, you know, when they suck it in, it, it, it drops into their mouth. So a spoon has an incredible hookup ratio compared to a frog, in my opinion. Now, we have gotten so much better now uh, that we know the system to throw a frog on, you know, and braid, which we didn't have back then. We were throwing all these a mono, five foot six pistol grips. You know, our hookup ratio used to be real poor back in the days compared to the equipment we have now. It's when amazing. When was the last time you threw a spoon in a derby? Um, I had one tied on here. I didn't throw it because the conditions didn't. Florida's a great place for it. Probably last time we were at Santee Cooper. Really? Yeah. Interesting. What else you got? Just going back for right, here's a Here's a great bait. That uh, you'll recognize it's made by Bomber called the Speed Shad. It's the original Speed Shad. Uh, introduced to this fishing uh, North Carolina and South Carolina lakes early in the year when they were drawn down on flat uh, clay points. 
mm-hmm. kind of replaces the rattle trap. Very similar action to a rattle trap, but it doesn't sink, so you don't have to reel it as fast. But you burn it across the points, the flat, structureless points. Uh, when the water's drawn down, it imitates shad. Fantastic. Uh, super popular at Bugs Island, Murray, that whole region. It was a, a staple. What, what's, what shape of bill is that? A great question, and Frank can probably answer it better than me. Other way. There you go. It's like a, it's almost like a semicircle bill, yep. like a heart. It's a heart, almost a heart shaped bill. That's yep. a bizarre bill. And it has a, does it have a tight wobble or a wide wobble? Cause that's a, that bill ex, extrudes way out of either side of that bait. Tighter than you'd think. Uh oh, we're losing some, losing some audio with Charlie there. Oh, probably. There you go. Yeah, it's a tighter wobble than you'd think. Because of the line tie being on the nose and not on the bill. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's key right there, huh? Most of those. Ah, not quite as versed in the uh, designing as Frank, but I am aware of that. Yeah, and by explain the way, that then, based the uh, the action of the lure based on whether it's tied onto the the eye is on the bill versus the nose of the bait. Yeah, and uh, by the way, Frank does a great job. On <laughs> He's going back for more. The, uh, I mean, these are these are not obsolete, and they're coming back more than ever. And uh, uh, Octo is going to make a fortune off of what we always threw, the old uh, handmade wood baits. This is the original wee bait. Anyone that's ever fished the Ohio River is familiar with the wee bait. Uh, no two are alike. Each one was handmade, and uh, there's something about that good old foil finish that they cannot imitate in any of the new glitter finishes there's something about that aluminum foil underneath that clear coat that uh it's an just you can't replace it they don't still make those do they? the gentleman that makes them i believe passed away but i believe he passed it on to a young man on how to make them they i believe they they do they have a wire form in them i think those but they're incredible. Really uh, they, cool looking. Just an old school little, but it's a balsa bait, right? You know, the funny thing is, uh, I showed them to Mr. Clun years and years ago, thinking I was showing him something new, you know, coming from Ohio. And one of my heroes, Rick Clun, I'm going to show him a cold bait. And he goes, those are wonderful. The only <laughs> problem with them, he goes, the only problem with them is they cast like a potato chip. <laughs> they cast like a potato chip. And he is right. They, uh, they're very hard to cast, but the action you can't duplicate with plastic or a square bill. Um, I've seen it in action. I, I mean, it, it, it will, it will kick your butt uh, if you're throwing a regular crankbait against one of these and you're on the Ohio River. And more so, is that like one of the East Tennessee? I know we mentioned that the classic is going to be in Knoxville later. That's the type of stuff that those guys will throw, like the handmade kind of tight yeah. wiggle balsa baits. Why do you think the fish like those? The so OG Slim. The that's that's just... OG Slim. <laughs> um, it just really imitates the, the, the shad better than a wide wobble. Better The shape of it, the float, it has a lot to do with how uh, the, the, the buoyancy of it has to have a lot to do with the buoyancy of it that adds the action. Um, Very similar is the uh, AC Shiner. Again. Oh, you didn't show me those when I was there. This is like the best, I call it a reverse Senko, because when you jerk this down and when it has to come back up, it fights its way to the surface. It wobbles its way back up to the surface. I I fish this thing on top. You can jerk, jerk, jerk it about three times. And when it's working its way back up, half the time they eat it on its way back up as it's flashing that foil back and forth. Frank Scalish talked about it one time. We were at uh, Santee Cooper throwing these at the base of cypress trees. And you talk about the most exciting fishing, but like he said, you'd lose half of them. But um, when a bass comes up to eat that thing at the base of a cypress tree, it, it's unbelievable. And uh, that's an AC shiner for action certified. That's what AC stands for. Really? Yep. And this is the 400 version, which is the four inch they make a three inch, they make a 2.75 inch. They actually make a uh, one that's more like a square bill or that wee bait I showed you. 
Um, again, the only problem with these wood baits and these balsa baits, they're fragile. They have a short life expectancy. Um, they, they don't, they're fragile. You throw them into the rocks, you catch several fish on them, they're pretty much toast. Um, they don't hold up long. But what an inc I can't tell you how many fish I've caught on that AC Shiner. When I first came down here fishing, a local taught me how to fish the number 11 Rapala like a top water bait. And this was the only improvement I put on what he taught me was the AC Shiner because it's actually twice as buoyant. It tries to pop up to the surface. Um, incredible. Yeah, I mean, you can catch them on it in the middle of summer at daybreak on the Ohio. When you need a bite, you know, again, though, it casts like a potato chip. You got to throw these on spinning rods almost exclusively. That's like a, he, he mentioned that rapple. I just remember I used to always throw the G11 when I went down to Canada. And I'll tell you how I figured out the pattern that I fish it like that. I'll never forget this. I was probably 10, 11, and I cast that sucker up into a tree and I broke it off and it fell into the water. And while my dad, we know we had the old 25 horse was idling over there to pick it up. A smallmouth came up and ate it off the surface. Got it before you could get it. And yeah. I was like, what the heck? And I just remember that it, you would, I would cast it out. Now jerk it and jerk it, and then it would come right up to the surface, and you just let it sit next to the stump or the rock or whatever. And man, those smallmouth with the red eyes would come up and just blast that thing. The, and, and it's uh, more and more of a top water deal. But then we, you know, we'd also troll them for walleye yep. and everything. But it, that that kind of long floating minnow style bait outside of a wake bait, which a lot of companies now have really solid plastic uh, wake baits, but there's still a couple that are like the OGs outside of a couple really isolated scenarios. And I believe there was just one on Pickwick where it was one using a, a wake, wake bait, bait. Yeah. but not many people use the floating wooden jerk, uh, jerk bait minnow style baits anymore. And, that was like the only thing people used for decades. I remember, you know, reading stuff. Well, obviously until like Fred Young came out the Big O and things like that. But the the Lori Lori Rapala, uh, Rapala uh, you'd like rent the Rapalas and all that stuff and and troll them and use them for all the species. You know, Matt, I'm, I hate to say this, but our sport's really young. And uh, I'm old enough to remember when you went and looked at a lure case in a store and there weren't that many options. You know, there was a Rapala, there was a Meps, there was a Flatfish, there was a, uh, uh, you know, there were not 30 different crankbaits to choose from. There were not 30 different soft plastics. There were not hundreds of options. Uh, Rapala was like one of your, you know, one of your few options in a hard bait when I was young. So there, there you know, they were... Uh, they were just evolving. Our sport is evolving so quickly. We have a very young sport. I mean, we're only up to like the 50th or so classic. That's a young sport. I mean, that's a, that's a really young sport. Um, something that no one seems to throw anymore, and I'm sure you can still get them, is the Baby One Minus. Incredible. One of the original wake baits. Uh, they got them all. Everyone's got a wake bait now. But you cannot believe how many tournaments were won and uh, how many fish I have caught on the original man's one minus gosh i'm terrible at that there it is no, you're good. <laughs> yeah and that bait will not run more than a foot deep i mean it will on uh, uh fluorocarbon but you put that on mono and it comes through lily pads it comes through weeds more than any crankbait will because of the way it runs it runs nose down the hooks are hidden in behind the bill uh, was amazed when I was turned on to that bait, how weedless it is that you could fish a crankbait in grass. And uh, the Potomac River, there were so many tournaments, one on the Potomac River on a one minus. He's going back for more. And of course, my favorite that I throw all the time is the deadly. I didn't know if you were, I didn't know if you were going to show that. Oh, yeah, I, I wasn't going to mention it. No one, it. I wasn't wants, gonna bring no one it wants to throw this thing. Uh, but I've caught so many giant fish on that. I weighed a 9.15 and an FLW at Okeechobee, maybe a 9.14. That's kind of a funny story because Brian Thrift was in line behind me and uh, he had one bigger than mine and he let him, all the riders have me hold my fish up and have me let me have my minute in the sun. 
and I waded in and took over Big Bass, and he gets up behind me without saying a word and knocks me out of Big Bass. He had it in his bag the whole time and didn't want to upstage me, and he just kept his mouth shut in the back line like, oh, Charlie's getting his moment in the sun. Let's not ruin it. That was kind of nice of him. That was a that was explain what that was for the listeners. I don't think you ever actually said the name of it, and I got it wrong when I when I was yeah. at the house. Everyone, everyone says the tiny torpedo, but it's the baby torpedo. It's about two and a half inches long. There is a tiny. It's real small, and then there's a magnum, which is much bigger, um, almost whopper plopper diameter. Um, but I change it out, put O rings on it, put a feather tail on it, and I uh, tune the tune the blade right. And I fish it very aggressively. Um, there's times you got to let it sit still. But one of the things I like about it is I can cover water with it. I, I fish it as aggressively as you see those guys fish for peacock bass with those rip baits. And uh, one thing I like about the bait is I always say, you know what? He might not have hit it, but I guarantee he knew it was there. You can, you know, uh, they have to make a decision not to bite that bait. It's not going to sneak by them. So they actually, every time I bring it by one, he has to decide whether he's going to eat it or not because it's making enough ruckus. Um, and as Tracy always used to say, she doesn't, they don't like it, how it farts on them. She goes, when that thing farts on them, they get mad because it leaves a little bubble trail like he's farting on top. Um, the uh, biggest bass I ever weighed in BASS competition, a 10 11. Uh, showed himself, showed herself on that prop bait. I, it took me 25 casts later with a Sanko to get her to bite. But she came up and boiled under that thing, and I knew when she boiled under it, you know, it was it was a huge fish. Um, probably came up off a of bed and wouldn't commit to it, but showed herself to me, and then I caught her. It was a 10-11. It was in an open down here, and Bobby Lane weighed an 11 pounds for big bass the first day. I had big bass the second day with a 10-11. And he weighed big bass the third day with an 11 again. And that's why I wintered down here, Matt. Um, when I came down here as a young man, we didn't have internet. We didn't have cell phones. There weren't 10 pounders in Texas yet. There weren't 10 pounders in California yet. If you wanted to catch a double digit bass, you went to Florida. And uh, I came down here as a kid on a spring break trip. All my buddies went to Daytona Beach chasing girls. And I came down here chasing big old sow bass with a little stump jumper and a pup tent. We stayed at the south end of Lake Kissimmee and we knew nothing about catching fish. But I knew when I left here, I was going to find a way to get back here as much as I could. And, and you know, the American dream years later, I've got a house here on the Kissimmee chain, which I always, always dreamed of. I'm so fortunate um, that every day I go fishing out there, I have a shot at a double digit bass and that you don't have that shot everywhere, especially in Ohio. Um, one of the toughest things for me since I've started wintering down here is not wanting to leave for tournaments. When you're in central Ohio and there's a tournament coming up, you can't wait to leave central Ohio. You're always going somewhere better to fish. And uh, like in a month and a half from now, when we have to leave here to go to Cherokee, it will be difficult to leave here to go to Cherokee because at that time of the year, we will be crushing them here. The weather will be absolutely wonderful. And I'm going to have to go up to Lake Cherokee. Wow, wow, wow. But uh, one of the easiest things, uh, you know, was with Syncom and the poor fishing in central Ohio was getting excited to leave for a tournament. And down here, I'm a thousand miles from Syncom and the fishing's great. So I'm not as motivated to leave for a tournament. You're exactly <laughs> a thousand miles, right? Exactly a, 1,000 like miles. 1,029 miles from Syncom to here. Um, and just like that commercial, I'm a thousand miles from nowhere. Um, you you talked about discovering that smallmouth eating that Rapala by uh, breaking it off and it falling out of a tree. I discovered jerk baiting the same way, Matt. Before I had ever heard the term jerk baiting, before there was jerk baiting. I mean, people were jerk baiting, but it didn't have a term. It wasn't a tactic. Um, I was fishing a bomber long a similar to the way i fished the ac shiner as a topwater bait and literally was ripping it into the boat jerking it trying to get grass off it or something and had a small mouth destroy it and i thought how crazy is that that you can jerk that bait that violently and get fish to eat it and then the more i did it and the more erratic and the more crazy you jerked it the more they bit it 
So, I mean, I'm not saying I invented it, but I self-taught myself that. But when you first start doing that, if someone doesn't show you that, it looks like you're having a seizure out there. It looks like you're fishing the bait totally wrong. Anyone that would see you doing that would go, you are crazy. That's not how you fish that bait. Um, so, you know, that's the neat thing about our sport. You can discover new tactics, new ways of doing it, you know, on your own. Uh, as a kid growing up fishing, I didn't have a father that was a bass pro. And I went out hours and hours and hours and just tried different things with lures, different ways to fish them. We didn't have all the information you guys have now. And it was it was trial and error and went a lot of days without ever catching a fish when I was trying to learn how to catch a fish. So I think that's the neatest thing about our sport is we're still inventing new ways to catch bass. And probably the coolest thing is, is you don't have to be fishing the way the winner's fishing. You can fish your way. I mean, we talk about this all the time. Aaron Martin's fish is his way. David Dudley fishes his way. Edwin Evers fishes his way. And they are all successful at it. Uh, you can be a totally different person. You do not have to fit the mold of a quarterback. Um, you know, to be successful in the in the in bass fishing, you can be an oddball, you can be a self taught guy. Um, even when a giant bag's brought in, there was a bigger bag out there to be caught. That's probably the coolest thing about our sport is there's no top, there's no limit. If a 40 pound bag could be caught, then that day a 45 pound bag could have been caught if someone made the right decisions. I think that's the neatest thing about our sport. And it's one of the things that makes me cast to the very last cast because I have caught big bass for the tournament before on the very last cast. That's a great transition, Charlie, because I know you're getting itchy to go fishing, but I want to take our final commercial break and I want to come back. And even though it's different for every angler and there's a number of different ways that you can get the job done, there are some it seems translatable aspects, things, themes that make certain anglers successful in Florida. And after we take the break, I want to get your thoughts on what those things are. It's BTL on a Tuesday with Charlie Hartley, and we'll be back. So, you're looking to buy fishing electronics, huh? Are you also looking for true experts to help guide you through it? Well, at the Bass Tank, you've come to the right place. We are live forward facing sonar pioneers with thousands of hours spent learning through winning trophies, cashing checks, and just having fun. Whatever brand you need, we have it. We offer free shipping and we have two financing options available. Our experts are here to help you. Call us today or visit thebasstank.com. The new Android series is the peak of the Denali lineup and offers the ultimate Denali experience. The Android series features 36-ton multi-directional graphite combined with interlock blank technology for added strength. Each rod is outfitted with royal titanium guides that will not fail. The blank is fitted into an easy touch, soft feel EVA foam grip with exposed blank reel seat. This all allows the Android to transmit every movement of your bait and even the most subtle bites. The Android series is the finest rod Denali has ever made and offers an angler the ultimate fishing experience with a limited lifetime warranty. See the full lineup of Android rods at DenaliRods.com. Combining one of the most popular hook styles with Gamakatsu's beefier Superline offering, the Gamakatsu Superline Offset Round Bend delivers the strength necessary to target big fish in heavy cover. Well suited for braided line and heavier fluorocarbon, the Gamakatsu Superline Offset Round Bend is built using stronger Superline wire that allows anglers to easily fish a finesse worm around heavy cover. The round bend offers a larger bite area, perfect for any worm presentation, while increasing your hookup ratios. The newly enhanced Z-Band holds your plastics on the hook longer, reducing the number of pull-offs and reducing damage to plastics. Available in 2-aught, 3-aught, 4-aught, and 5-aught, this is the most durable worm hook, designed for heavier lines that hold your bait on longer. Preparation is key to success. And that preparation starts well before you ever hit the water. You're only as strong as your connection to the fish, and your line is that critical connection. Confidence in your line every minute of every day on the water is a necessity, and failure, it's not an option. Sunline makes the fluorocarbon, 
nylon, and braided lines to give you the strength to guarantee your confidence. Vibrating jigs are a great choice for any time of year, and the Kamikaze Swim On is a perfect match for any vibrating jig. Two sizes and the unique tail design gives it a bait fish profile and a great swimming action for realism. There are 17 colors. See them all at BigBiteBaits.com. The Spro Little John crankbait has been around for almost 15 years, and it is one of my go-to crankbaits whenever I need a fish in the boat, so you can never have enough new colors. That's why Spro is coming out with a handful of new colors, including Pearl Shad, which has this bleached out white look, but it's got this pearlescent, really, really pretty. We've got Copper Shad, which looks amazing in the water. It's got that purple flake on the back, really, really pops in the water. And then if you want some real pop, we've got Sparkle Shad, nothing but sparkles all over this thing. And then last but not least, we've got the matte sexy shad just a really different looking color for a crankbait so you want to give them a little different look that matte sexy shad is definitely the one to go with all these colors are available in the original little john and the md welcome back to btl talking with charlie hartley and we just went through a treasure trove of old lures that still catch fish. And I had a big list of stuff that I wanted to talk about. We didn't even get into a lot of that stuff, Charlie. But it's been awesome about going through all those lures and talking a little bit of strategy, the mental game, keeping things together. Thank I you just, for showing I, us all those yeah, gems. I just, I just looked at the clock and didn't realize we were already an hour in. It's it. We have so much fun talking about fish, and it seems like it's been five minutes. I was like, oh, how am I going to have enough what, what do I find enough to talk about? Yeah. <laughs> I know. It always, it always works out. One of the things that I wanted to talk about for sure before with the uh, Elite Series, the next two stops happening in Florida, we just had the uh, MLF Toyota Series, the Bassmaster Open. Florida's an annual stop. There's guys who aren't from Florida who have figured it out and catch them. There's guys from Florida who figured it out and catch them. Then there's guys who's been around for a long time, and they've never figured it out, Charlie. And yeah, it seems Florida. like it's a feast or a famine. So, yeah. like I said, you're an Ohio guy who winters down in Florida. You literally fish every day. So what better guy to ask? What are some of the themes that make anglers successful in Florida? Uh, Florida's obviously an, an anomaly because no other state has the fear or the uh, uh, the superstition that you know you got to get out of florida alive you got to get out of florida alive the best fishermen in the world say that and we don't go to any other state where they say that so oh, it's yeah, not we got out of wisconsin alive <laughs> yeah no or, or any of them you know yeah, we got yeah, out of yeah. texas alive no you can't wait to go to texas you know um it's because it is so unique it's the most uh, tropical region of north america uh it is unique to itself there's even southern texas southern california do not look like florida uh, as you've seen matt you've been all over the country it's it's tropical it's everglades it feels like you're on safari in the morning there's alligators there's tropical birds there's things blooming in january it's a totally different animal and it confuses anyone who has 30 or 40 years fishing history other places when i first started coming down here I despised Florida fishing because I knew those giant fish were there. The shiner fishermen would bring them in. The locals would bring them in. But it, it was like reading a foreign language. And that's what it is to most people that come here. It is not. You can't look for a topography line. There is no depth changes. There's no bank. Uh, there's no point of reference that looks normal to you. When I first started coming down here, I'm old enough to remember prior to Hydrilla. And prior to Hydrilla, it was a little simpler because most of the emergent grass was what they had to utilize. We could see it. We had something to cast at. It made sense to us. But now with the Hydrilla, literally the whole lake is habitat, as you discovered. The fish, you can catch one in the middle of the lake as easily as you can catch one up in a canal. Um, and, and one of the main things to try to remember, and I learned this at Amistad, very similar to Lake Amistad, you have all those beautiful flooded bushes. 
And the first thing you need to do is not fish any of those flooded bushes, which is impossible because they all look like they should have a fish in them. But there's a jungle of those bushes under the boat too. And you got to realize that, yes, when it's spawning time, they're up in there. But other than that, that's not where they live. That's not where they eat. And, uh, you know, you go out and graph offshore and it doesn't make any sense at all. There's no depth change. Uh, you're really looking for density in the grass. You're looking for places the grass ends and begins. Um, you're looking for corridors. The, uh, it took me years to become a proficient Florida fisherman uh, mm -hmm. because you have to throw out a lot of the things you learned. Um, you know, uh, I don't get to flip my jig on a lay down down here. I don't get to fish many docks down here. Um, but, uh, it took me years to learn, but you get your butt kicked enough times and you'll get your butt off that bank and you'll get out there in that main lake. And as much as you struggle and as hard as it is to learn, uh, when you find a spot out there, it's a spot, you know, the other real unique thing about Florida is that it, it each lake changes more in one year than your grand lake will change in a hundred years. Every year I come back here, the grass is different. The bank is different. There are parts of the lake that are inaccessible that I used to fish. There's parts of the lake that are wide open that used to be full of grass. So one of the neatest things, Okeechobee's notorious for it, it's a totally different lake every time you go back. Um, although your waypoints will still come into play. It's, it's always amazing to me. I was on Okeechobee when it was almost dry once. The next year it fills up. You go back to your waypoints that were dry for over a year and the bass are in the same places. Um, it has a lot to do with bottom content, gel beds, um, wind direction. Um, they are drastically affected by weather and cold fronts. If you've seen, I've never seen fish shut off more from a cold front than a Florida bass especially a Florida bass in Florida. Um, so what makes a good Florida fisherman is uh, uh, throwing out almost everything you know and realizing you're in Florida for this tournament and you got to fish like a Florida guy. You got you to fish Florida style while you're here. As far as like the plastics thing, uh, that's what I don't know. I've never really figured out why you don't move your bait. It's like, just, just I don't understand how they find it, how they see it, but it's a thing. I've seen it. That was one of the things that you kind of taught. One of the, the little tips that you gave me was like, dude, quit moving your stuff. And what is it about those fish that will eat a dead stick plastic? Um, when Florida fish are in that mood that they don't want to chase, they, I mean, they don't want to chase. They don't even want to chase a piece of plastic. Um, especially what you saw this Last couple of weeks, if there's anywhere near the spawn, dead sticking works so good in Florida, it's crazy. And it, it just has to do with the bait sitting there long enough that they want it out of there. You know, if it comes flying through there, they're like, that's fine. It's leaving. I didn't want it to stay here anyway. But when something stays there, they're defending their bed or their little one foot area there. And they're like, get out of here. You, if you don't get up and get out of here, I'm going to get you out of here. And you got to admit, when they eat that thing dead stick and they eat it, they're not, mm -hmm. yeah, they've got it. They've got it. They've had enough of looking at it. Um, I use that technique more than just Florida, though. I think our fish are conditioned um, to a bait falling in front of them and someone taking it away. So they're like, you know what? I'm going to check to see if that thing leaves because those, those artificial things leave pretty quick because the angler's pretty anxious. And when something lays there long enough, they go over and investigate it. And they're like, how come that hasn't jumped up and gone on, on to another cast yet? I get a lot of bites just that way. Uh, but it takes a lot of patience. Uh, the other thing to realize in Florida is when you catch a fish, you're in the right place. You, you don't need to go run into another fish. Y usually if you catch a fish in Florida, there's enough there to do well. Sit tight. You think, oh, I figured something out. Now I'm going to go duplicate it. You haven't figured out anything. You figured out where some fish are, and that's why you see packs of boats in Florida. Um, the thing that uh, I, I've had the honor of fishing with Terry Seagraves down here a lot. Uh, he fish, He's an offshore fisherman. has taught me so much, and what he taught me is when you're out there and you find the spot, even though you're offshore, that spot might only be as big as your boat, and it might only be as big as the hood of your truck, and you think it's a grass line for a mile. I can work down it. It's not. 
it's not they're not using a whole edge they are right there <laughs> Interesting. all right you got anything else or are you ready to go fishing I'm ready to go fishing, but I could talk to you forever. I do want to, uh, I have been watching the BP tour, the first one down at Darbone. I think it's cool that they're at a lake we've never seen, but I think it's a shame they hit the conditions they hit. It looks like they could have really weighed some big bags of fish if they were catching more than one or two bites a day. The average size of the fish down there, the fishery and the health, you've seen those fish on the video. My mm -hmm. gosh, they are like footballs. And I'm so glad live fishing's back because, you know, that was a long break. What was that? Three months we didn't have live fishing. I am such a junkie. I listen to you and I listen to live while I'm out fishing, man. I, I not only fish, but watch it at the same time. So to me, that's like I'm like a kid in a candy store. I think Bassmaster starts tomorrow at the St. John's and uh, go Rick Klein. Let's see if Rick Klein can win another elite series at the St. John's River. Who else is on my side there? There's no one I'd rather see win that tournament than Rick Clark. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, go keep your streak alive, Charlie. Go catch a fish, and thanks for uh, thanks for hopping on today. I really appreciate it. You're doing a great job. Tell Mark I said hi. Will do. Bye, buddy. See ya. All right, that was uh, Charlie Hartley. Kind of giving up a little bit of juice down there, some old school baits, talking a little bit about Florida and like what he says is true. Like, I mean, I, I never figured it out, like I said, down there, but there were like little moments where I understood. I was kind of like, oh, that kind of makes sense like that. I kind of figured that out a little bit. He did mention the BPT going down on at Lake uh, Darbone. I think this is the last day they're on Darbone, and then they move to a different lake. But uh, Mark Daniels Jr. wins the Group A there uh, by a little bit of a margin. Stephen Browning, I don't think, caught a fish uh, yesterday, and it only took seven pounds, eight ounces, I believe, in two days to make the cut. The Group B is on the water today looking to do the same thing and move on to the knockout round. And then uh, I think the Elite Series are all off tomorrow from practice for a uh, media day uh, day to get things ready before they kick things off on the St. John's River coming up tomorrow on BTL. I said this yesterday, a, a guest who is uh, long overdue for an appearance on the show, and that's Matt Stefan. A uh, really cool story of how he got into the sport, the industry, the job that he was in before it. And then just kind of a real uh, intellectual guy who's been sneaky good over the past decade on the FLW uh, Tour and now the MLF Pro Circuit. And then Frank Scalish will be back uh, for a day four. I have absolutely no idea what he is planning uh, on bringing, but I will update the website as soon as he does. Uh, I will also get the code for the BPT Fantasy League for everyone to join. And then you don't have to have a code or anything. You just have to sign up for the Bass Master, and it's just Bass Talk Live. So make sure you join uh, both of those groups. And also, uh, I mention this every now and then, if you want a BTL hat, BTL shirt, hoodie, whatnot, store is still open, and that stuff is actually in stock. It's not like you don't have to wait two weeks like you order it and they send it to you. So just click on the shop BTL tab on the top of the basszone.com website. I think that's all we got for a Tuesday. Thanks for joining a big thanks to Charlie Hartley for taking time off of the water. Like I said, the guy, he gets up, he works for like four or five hours, and then he fishes the rest of the day. He's got it figured out. So big thanks to Charlie Hartley, Matt, Steph on tomorrow, Frank on Thursday. That's all we got for BTL on a Tuesday. We'll see you tomorrow.